The Remedial Herstory Project is a nonprofit working to get women's history into the primary and secondary history curriculum. To help us meet our goal, we produce media, lesson plans, and so much more. You can check it out on our website, www.remedialherstory.com. Our project is funded through grants and by patrons, potentially like you. Thank you to our patrons, Jeff, Barbara, Christian, Kent, Jamie, Jenna, Nancy, Megan, Leah, Mark, Nicole, Anne, Sarah, Alicia, Katia, Michelle, Jessica, Laura, and Jackie. If you would like to join these wonderful people and become a patron, you can head over to patreon.com and become a supporter of the Remedial Herstory Project. You too can help us reform education and allow women to be seen, heard, and complicated. Hey, Kelsey. Hey, Brooke. Want to tell everyone what's happening in today's episode? In this episode, we are going to my favorite topic of all time, World War II. Oh, yeah, we never talk about that. (laughs) (laughs) And we're going to be talking about some badass women on the Eastern Front of the war. Oh, can't wait to learn. (laughs) Hello, and welcome to Remedial Her Story, the other 50% the podcast that explores what happened to the women in history class. Now, here's your host, Kelsey Brooke Eckert, and her partner in crime, Brooke Neva Sullivan. In this episode, we are going to be asking the question, were Soviets more supportive of gender equality? And we have my friend and colleague, Jackie Nelson, back on the podcast (sighs) to inform us. That's awesome. (laughs) So, Brooke, in World War II, Germany has, just like World War I, has to fight a two-front war. They are fighting with the Americans and the British and, yep. you know, other other allies on the Western side of their country. Yep. And then they are fighting mostly with the Soviet Union, now the Soviet Union, on the Eastern Front. Okay. And World War I and World War II are very similar in that the... Soviets have the highest casualty rate of any country during the war because of what's going on on okay. the Eastern Front. It's interesting because I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot about the Eastern Front because we have like a very American bias about the way that we learn yeah, about that Yeah, I don't war. know much about that. Just in similarly, I really, you know, you get a very American-centric um, narrative of yeah. that. So I don't know much. And I'm... I guess I really am surprised that there's women. (laughs) A lot of women. A lot of women. And it should not have surprised me, but (laughs) Jackie, yet again, blows my mind all the time. Um, And, you know, it has to do with the communist doctrine of social equality. Right. And and getting rid of class. And and we have so many American, you know, pro-capitalism, pro-democracy biases about... That that <clears throat> lend us towards not appreciating communism, right? Um, and and let me be very clear from the outset: this is not going to be an episode that like promotes communism by any <laughs> means, um, because we talk right in the outset about some of the like serious problems that are going on right. in Soviet Russia leading up to the war. But in a weird way, the way that the Soviets treated women during the war was more egalitarian in some ways, and we'll let people decide based on the evidence Jackie provides, but um, in some ways, then uh, in the other Western allied nations like Amazing. Britain, France, and the United States. So, so it's kind of interesting. And I think it's a really important question to ask. I think it challenges some of the like Cold War narrative that we've adopted and sort of just like take as fact in yeah. our in our world. And then I also think, you know, undoing that American-centric bias of how we teach World War II, this episode will help teachers do that because they'll have some knowledge of at least the women. And and, right. and Jackie does a really good job of providing broader context to the Eastern Front. Um, and I'm just so excited to get this into teachers' hands because I think it's really yeah, powerful. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So let's have Jackie introduce herself. I'm Jackie Nelson. (laughs) I'm a military historian, and I teach at Plymouth State University. And I specialize mostly in the American Revolutionary period, but I I tend to sort of dot all over the place with war, and uh, World War II has long been a fascination of mine. So that's where we're focusing. And that is what (laughs) unites us. I 
am obsessed <laughs> with World War II. I think we've had too many uh, World War II topics on our podcast <laughs> already, but Fair. is there too many? Never. 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 Um, fun caveat, my mom hates World War II. You know, last episode, I threatened to fight you. Now I have to fight your mom. <laughs> <laughs> She literally won't watch any movie that comes out if it's based on World War II. Mm. She's like, it's overdone. I'm like, no. it's never overdone. I will watch it. I will cry for a week. I will watch it again. Yeah. <laughs> My mom's a patron, so mm. we'll have to think about Okay. I to... won't I won't fight you. Okay. <laughs> I'll want to, but I won't. <laughs> so today we are going to talk about World War II. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited because so much of my knowledge about World War II is, uh, first of all, allied mm. knowledge. Mm -hmm. Second of all, it's very American-British bias, but yes. there were the big three. Yes. And Stalin and those those dang Soviets, they were there. <laughs> Absolutely. They were on the wrong side of the war mm -hmm. at the start, or rather just sort of neutrally, non-aggression-y yes. <laughs> there. And... Um, and you're going to fill us in on some Soviet women who were badasses. Absolute badasses. And I cannot wait to yes. learn about this. <laughs> Uh, and your experience is the same for most people. Like most um, Americans in particular really only learn about the Western allies. And that is 100% because we go seamlessly from World War II to the Cold War. So – for Americans, like we try to all but erase the Russian side of the war for, for dual reasons. We don't ever want to look at them as doing anything heroic, and we don't want to look at them as being victims either. Yeah. When in reality, they had the most horrific casualties of the entirety of the war. So for like the European side of the war, both with soldiers and civilians, I think they had close to about half of the casualties of the war. So like – they got ravaged by it, and they fought as hard as they could, like tooth and nail, to eventually turn that tide around. But because we immediately go into conflict with one another, and and because we rightfully have a lot of questions about Russian leadership from this point forward, um, we we really push the Russian side of the war away when there was a lot of like really fascinating things happening mm -hmm. in Russia during the war. If I had an expertise, mm -hmm. it would be on D-Day. Yes. And I know that the Russians or the Soviets were really frustrated with um, the allies, their allied partners, yeah. uh, for not making that advance sooner yeah, and for delaying the invasion that everybody knew would, was sort of inevitably going to be attempted. Yep. And, um, and, and that resentment, I think fuels the Soviets into the cold war. Like yeah. how dare you make us suffer the brunts of this war while you sit cushy in, in London. Mm -hmm. And yeah. So yeah, there's a lot of really important context to, um, World War II, and as well as the Cold War, that's lost when you exclude the Soviet narrative in in the in the story. So, mm -hmm. I'm so excited. So, um, give us some. We've already touched on a good deal of context there, but is there yeah. any context that we haven't talked about that you think we should be included? Yeah. Um. So, I mean, with with for Russia's experience in the war, um, I I could literally go on. 4 million separate tangents right now about the actual start of the war. Was it in Asia? Was it in Europe? On and on and on and on. But um, when we're looking at what most people like traditionally look at as the start of the war, it was around Poland. And right before Hitler invaded Poland, he had signed that non-aggression pact with Stalin and with Russia. And it's basically agreeing that neither of those two parties are going to go to war with each other for, I think it was like a period of 10 years or something like that. And neither of them signed it in true faith whatsoever. Like they both fully intend to go to war with each other. They're both just buying time. Hmm. Uh, Germany doesn't want to end up in the same situation that they did in World War I, and they don't want to be split across two separate theaters. So Hitler's rationale is – I'm going to clean up Britain and France, then I can turn my full weight on Russia. So he's just buying time for that. For Russia, Stalin's own purges have also like 
emptied huge pockets of his civilian population, uh, officers in his army, soldiers in his army. So he is also not ready for a war with Germany. Hmm. So they're just doing it to buy time. But Hitler does eventually turn his weight on France. He's successful there, but he stalls out trying to invade Britain. And once that takes place, he gets itchy and he has to keep moving. Like the entire power of blitzkrieg warfare is based on speed. Like everything has to be happening really quickly um, because just as much as it's powerful in terms of the physical effects that it has, it's powerful on the psychological effects that it has. So that's part of what Blitzkrieg is, is just when your enemy is all of a sudden coming at you at their full strength, it feels like it's something that's unstoppable. And his attempts to invade Britain, they put a, a real like break on that. So he turns his full weight on Germany, and or sorry, he, Germany turns its full weight on Russia, and he comes storming in with about three million soldiers. They're in these three separate army groups, and they are like fully charging their way through the Russian countryside, and they're getting to the outskirts of all of these major cities, and we're starting to kind of see a return to World War I. Mm. We're seeing battles that are lasting months and years at a time. We're seeing these long sieges that are coming with million-man casualties for civilians and for soldiers alike. Um, and it's a real point of desperation for Russia, but it's also a point where they kind of harness all of the internal strength that they have. Like um, The Soviet Union is really like the colossus of Europe, because of not only their territorial size, but their industrial strength, their population size, like they have a lot of factors that are going to be pivotal to them in this war. But one of the things that makes them so successful and one of the reasons why they are able to turn the tide even after they um, have these initial struggles is the fact that they they are able to harness all of those tools that they actually have. Hmm. Earlier, you mentioned um, Stalin's purges, mm -hmm. and I would be remiss not to mention this film that I saw, um, because I think it's a factor, like you were talking yeah. about, as to why they they sign the non-aggression pact. Um, a film came out in 2019 called Mr. Jones. It does not pass the Bechdel test, and so <laughs> this is very important. As a feminist, I need to acknowledge right. that this is is bad. Yeah. Um, but it's called Mr. Jones, and it stars James Norton, who I love. Um, mm. it, it's about a Welsh journalist who breaks the news in the Western media about the famine in the Ukraine in the 1930s mm. preceding World War II. And if you're a teacher out there who's really unfamiliar with the context to the Russian experience, um, not in addition to like the communist revolution and all of those things, this is really important context and, and gen you know, it's a genocidal famine that, yeah. that devastates Ukraine. And I think given what's going on in Ukraine today and yeah. the, you know, militarization of the border between Russia and the Ukraine, having uh, you, you and your students having this sort of context would be great. Yeah. And um, certainly you could do research into that, but also this film is a really easy way to, to teach that history. So it's really good. Yeah. I, I recommend it. It's very dark and very, mm. I think it's rated R. I'm assuming it's rated yeah. R. So anyway, really amazing. So Russia and Germany go mm -hmm. to war yes. uh, eventually. And similar to World War One, this it's a very bloody yes. conflict, yes. Uh, and Russia is taking the brunt of the war because the Western allies are protected by natural borders, right? right. Like the English Channel. Yep. So, I mean, France is a, is a goner, but yeah. that was obvious <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. from so many things. Mm -hmm. So, tell me about this conflict as it's, you know, what it, it's, it's bloody, it's, yeah. it's playing out. Um, so there's always like the long going adage and joke about invading Russia in the winter. Yeah. And the truth is, is people have invaded Russia in the winter time and they have been able to defeat that, that animal that is Russia in the winter time. But Napoleon. Yeah. But the, the 
The thing that really causes the biggest problem for the Germans is that, like I mentioned, Blitzkrieg is all predicated on speed. So they're moving as quickly as they possibly can. But as soon as they start to get to the outskirts of these cities where the Germans are, or sorry, the Russians are really like digging their heels in, once they start to face those early stalls, they're forced to try to get through Russia first in the fall, which is their rainy season. And this mm. completely washes out the roads. So a lot of German equipment gets bogged down. They're not able to kind of um, complete entire assaults of major cities before winter sets in. And they weren't really prepared for that. They weren't prepared to still be like in siege mode when winter set in. So that's something that kind of like damns them. Um, but Russia is equally culpable in a lot of their losses because Stalin was determined to win by all means necessary. And there are multiple instances where he was outright sacrificing his own people. Um, there are a lot of stories about certain cities that he would not allow the civilians to evacuate ahead of time because he felt that the soldiers would fight harder if the civilians were still there. Mm. So it's just like, it's a complete and utter nightmare zone throughout the entirety mm. of the war. But whether it be a matter of desperation, as some historians have posited, or if it ties into socialist and communist ideas of uh, civilian equality, including equality between the genders, as others have, it was in that time that Stalin also opened the doors for women to join the military. And to the point that, because most Western nations uh, did that, most allowed women to join. Uh, 350,000 American women joined the military, but they were all forced to join distinctive women's branches of the military. Like you had the wax for the army, you had the waves for the Navy, the wasps for the Air Force. And most had pretty strict rules about how women were not permitted to participate in combat. And it doesn't mean that was always the case. Um, there are a number of stories about the uh, female branches of the Marines in the Pacific sort of ending up in combat-like positions. Um, most, I think it was like 70% of American women ended up in what were considered like traditional quote-unquote female jobs. So they were doing uh, clerical work, uh, nursing, but even nursing very often brought you to the front lines. Um, women were drivers. They were bringing in supplies to the front lines. They were pilots, which wasn't meant to put them in danger, but still obviously had a fair amount of risk. Two um, of the women who perished on D-Day, buried at Arlington Cemetery, mm -hmm. were driving Jeeps right. when they died, actually. Right. Yeah. yeah, so... Yeah, so they're they're never they're not allowed in combat, but that doesn't mean that they are devoid of it either. Yeah. Plenty of women were involved in um, the intelligence communities too. You know, so like there were a lot of roles that women were playing in Western armies, but they were never meant to be combat oriented. And Russia went the exact opposite direction. Yeah, they did. Like they were just like, nope, like come on in, do what you're going to do. And still, a lot of Russian women ended up serving in like clerical positions and serving as nurses and doing those important roles. But it's something about like 800,000 Soviet women fought in the war and many of them directly in combat. They were allowed right to the front lines. Um, Equal and, pay? That I couldn't answer, but... Okay. Don't it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Eventually, women were also permitted in Russia to join the Air Force. And that's the first group of ladies that I wanted to talk about, this group that becomes known as the Night Witches, because they are my absolute favorites of the war. That's the best name right? ever. Right? And the Germans gave it to them like hatefully, yeah. like, like totally meant to be an insult. And they're like, yeah, we are. Like, yeah. <laughs> like completely took on the name. Have you seen the, I don't know, it's like a meme or something. It's like, I am the descendants of the witches you couldn't burn. <laughs> no, like, but yes. I love it. <laughs> I kind of, I think women need to embrace the idea mm. of witches. Right. Like, yeah, fine. Right. Call me a witch. Absolutely. Yeah. Who's badass. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Germans call them the night witches. Right. So, and that's just a nickname for mm -hmm. these women pilots. Yes. Okay. Yes. So they are part of the 588th Night Bomber Division, or sorry, Night Bomber Regiment. 
basically they're uh, they're led by this woman Marina Reskova, mm-hmm. and she was already a civilian aviator. Um, There's a number of women in Russia that were inspired by like Amelia Earhart, and they had started like these civilian um, aviation clubs. So she was already sort of like semi famous, but. She goes to Stalin and she's able to convince him, like, you know, you've already got women in combat on the ground. Why wouldn't you also put them in the air? And Stalin, throughout his very, very dark career, was always kind of persuaded to do whatever it would take to win. And um, like I mentioned before, there's a lot of people who say that this is out of desperation for Russia. And while Russia is definitely facing casualties in the millions, there doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence that they were struggling for pilots. So I don't think it is as much of a they're they're putting women in this position because they're desperate. I think it's more of a it's all hands on deck. If women can participate, let them. Once those doors were open, thousands of women came out to enlist in this. They had to go through a year of really heavy training, and a number of them will become pilots, but they also had to become their own navigators. They had to become their own mechanics, like everything. Um, So uh, these women that come in, they're mostly girls in their late teens and in their early 20s. Um, A lot of them, like Raskova, are, you know, emboldened by people like Earhart, and they want to be able to serve in this Um, field that is predominantly male. But also, whenever we look at women in war, we have to remember they're motivated to go to war for the exact same reasons that men are. They're drawn there for the cause. They are drawn there for their country. They're drawn there because they hate the enemy. Some of them are drawn simply because they want that sense of adventure and and steady pay. And so you have these women that are in there for that adventure. They're like, oh, I want to be like like Earnhardt was. But then you also have, um, or Earhart, um, you also have women that are coming in and they're openly saying, I'm here because I want to kill Germans. Mm. Germans killed my brother. They killed yeah. my father. Like, this is why I'm joining the war. Yeah. Revenge. Exactly. So they they spend a really heavy year training. And this is the part that I find so ironic and such like this funny twist of history. After that year of training was over, the best pilots and navigators that they had got put into the 586th regiment, which was their fighter regiment. So these women are being sent off to participate like as fighter pilots. And eventually, that regiment sort of gets, like, dispersed in with, like, male regiments, too. So it doesn't stay female for all that long. It becomes more integrated. The second most qualified go to the 587th, which was the bomber regiment. So they're going to be doing traditional bombing raids with, like, traditional equipment. And then the third, the least most qualified, went to the 588th, which were the ones that became known as the Night Witches. They were the most effective, they were the most feared, and then became the most famous. So they were considered the least qualified. That's hilarious. But they ended up being the best, and they ended up being the only um, Air Force regiment for the Russians that stayed entirely female throughout the whole war. So women did make it into those other regiments. They were good pilots that that did make it, but they're not the ones that we learn the most about or at least got famous. Yeah. Well, and it's also um, pretty often the women that got kind of scattered out to male regiments just because of prejudice, they didn't end up getting to serve a primary role anymore. So you might get pushed off to an integrated unit, but you're probably not going to fly as much or you might not fly at all. You know, Mm -hmm. like you kind of get sidelined a little bit. But with the 588th, they like it is all women. The um the pilots are women, the navigators are women, the mechanics are women, the administration, everything, the entirety of the regiment is all women. And they all end up getting that nickname of being the night witches. Hmm. And um because they're considered the least qualified, but they can still have some sort of an effect, they're going to be bombing at night. They're going to have the most limited equipment. They're going to have um, limitations in everything that they have. Um, they're not given a ton of respect in the beginning. Like, it's not expected that they're going to do much other than just wreak havoc every once in a while. They are given hand-me-down uniforms from men, so they're loose. They don't fit well. Um, they're given boots from men. They're, a lot of the women had to like uh, cut up their own bedding to fit into the boots just so that they could walk in them because they were too big. This reminds me of my JV soccer experience. <laughs> I think my uniform was like 
Like, I, I mean, I weighed like soaking wet. I was probably like 104 pounds in high school. Yeah. But I remember putting on this uniform that like could have fit like three of us in it, you know, <laughs> right, like, right. oh my gosh. Right. Just okay. whatever's available. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awful. Yeah. So they get that, but they also got the worst of possible equipment. The planes that they had, um, there's a... There's an old Washington Post article, which I think they put it perfectly, that they took like these rickety old crop dusters and they turned them into killing machines. And one historian said they were literally like a flying coffin. <laughs> like that's all that they were because they're they're biplanes. Like hmm. they literally are used for things like crop dusting. Hmm. They're these super old planes. They It's basically like you have an engine. The rest is made out of plywood and canvas is stretched over it. So there are no Whoa. frills of technology. There is no nothing. It's completely wide open. So when you're flying, you are entirely exposed to all of the elements its top speed was like 90 miles an hour or something. So like you are slow. It's so um, – It's like I'm going to bomb you, exactly. but then your fighters will come get me in right. two seconds. Exactly. Yeah. Well, it, it's got some like benefits in that in that quarter, but I mean it's, it's, um, it's very slow. It, it can't carry much weight, so it carries like the pilot and the navigator, and it can carry two bombs, one under each wing. It's it's really like what a happens when you drop the first one? Does the whole plane like <laughs> you gotta think like you gotta be real fast? Like, yeah, I would think. Um, and it's it's so slow and it's so light that they have to fly really low, which is mm. why they had to bomb at night because they would be very easily spotted. Um, so they have to fly low, so low in fact that they don't even have parachutes because they're like. They're probably not going to open in time, so why take that extra oh weight? <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, because they could just jump. But no, 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 no. no. no it's sort like, of just like... It's not going to open in time. It's not <laughs> worth it. Exactly. Like, we don't need that extra weight. You're Forget a goner. It. Yeah. Oh, my God. Um, no frills of technology. <laughs> like, they have to rely entirely on paper maps. They have to retire... Uh, or um, They have to focus on their compasses. They have to use stopwatches. They have to use flashlights. Like, they literally have, like, no frills of technology whatsoever. So it's literally like the worst of equipment that they could be given. And the worst pilots. <laughs> and supposedly the worst pilots. Um, however, there are some there are some good advantages to it. Because it flies so slow, like its maximum speed is actually below the stall rate for German fighter planes. So German planes can't go slow enough to chase you. So <laughs> <laughs> Which seems like a weird advantage, but it actually technically is an advantage because That's hilarious. isn't that great? Um, because if Germans want to try to engage you, they have to like be exceptionally like strategic and maneuvered to try to like work around you because you can go so much slower than they can. That's hilarious. Oh my God. <laughs> and the plane is so much more maneuverable because yeah. it's so much lighter than German planes. So it was really Really, really hard for German planes to engage you. However, it would be really easy for you to get shot down from the ground. Um, yeah. And and very often that was the case of what happened for these women. Um, they don't pop up on radar or infrared scans because the plane is almost entirely wood. Um, so they're not getting picked up by that. But by this time, um, once you're about a year, year and a half into the war after the German invasion, um, German cities are prepared for bombing all the time. They're getting it from the Western Allies. They're getting it from Russia. So very often around any targets that these women would be going after, they have um, spotlights that are looking for you. They have anti-aircraft guns on the ground waiting for you. And if any of those hit your plane, you're in a bad spot, particularly if one of the tracer bullets hit you, the ones that had the incendiary chemical on them so that you could see where you were firing at night, that mm -hmm. could light your whole plane on fire if you had been hit by one of those. But they got hit all the time. Like they're uh, one of the women, Popova maybe, um, one of the women came back to one of the little like temporary bases that they were using and she had 42 bullet holes mm -hmm. in her plane. Another one, the entire bottom of her plane got shot out and she still just 
rode that thing back yeah. to their temporary base. My husband's a psychologist, and mm-hmm. he loves to tell a story about, and I don't know where this occurred during World War II, but mm-hmm. this plane um, got shot up yeah. and flew back to, you know, its base. Yeah. And they were looking at these, you know, hundreds of holes yeah. that are in the plane. Yeah. And people are like, how do we... You know, this is a psychologist talking, so like this is you know what stood out to them. Mm -hmm. But how do we prevent all these holes from being put into the plane? Yeah, and he's and you know the people were like, no, 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 no. This plane made it back, right? So the places that got hit with holes, it's fine if those places get hit with holes. Exactly. Like look where it's not getting hit. Look where it's not getting hit, and that's what we need to protect because that's what like the fact that that didn't get hit is what made it get back. Right. So getting shot up isn't a really bad but it's probably really terrifying oh yeah, yeah. especially when you are in a plywood plane <laughs> like it's yeah. gotta be a horrifying prospect but um again these planes because they don't uh, it, it's almost an advantage that they don't have all of the necessary like technology and quite as many working parts is that you could have somebody whose entire bottom of their plane got ripped apart by bullets and fell off and you can still manage to fly it back. God, that'd be horrifying. I know. And like you're out and in the also element. they're probably used to these women yeah. are probably used to just like operating with very little. But if you're reliant yeah. on that device that got shot exactly. up and it doesn't work, right. then you have to navigate without it or whatever. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's so cool. Yeah. And I mean, like it has other advantages too. Like being this small little biplane, you can kind of like take off and land anywhere that you want to. So they very often had like these little temporary bases nearby whatever target they were going after and they would go off and do these these missions all night long they would often have to do anywhere between like 8 and 20 missions a night because you can only go with those two bombs so they would fly they would go um here's their whole process i think like i love their whole process it's amazing um but they would fly to whatever their target was it's only the pilot and the navigator that are on board and as soon as they get into range of whatever their target is Like they're that close to it, the navigator will tap the driver or the pilot on the shoulder and she kills the engine. So then you start running basically silently. All that people can hear is just like that, like the whoosh going through, which is why they got that nickname is it sounds like brooms flying through the air. So they do that. And then as soon as they get over whatever the target is, the navigator is the one that reaches out to the two wings and drops the bombs. And then the driver has to restart the engine hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> and then you would go back to whatever your temporary base was and you're sitting there and your other night witches, your your grounds crew are sitting there and as soon as you pop on the ground, they're refueling you, they're reloading you with bombs. If you had gotten attacked, your maintenance workers are doing whatever they can to repair and then you pick up and you go again. Like each one of these missions is anywhere between a half hour and an hour long and you just do and these That's first. crazy. It speaks to how close the yeah. the boundaries are between yeah. where Soviets are and where Germans are yeah. on the Eastern Front. Absolutely. Wow. Hey, Kelsey, I don't think our listeners know about the new upcoming project that we're working on. Which one? The video series. Oh, the video series. That's awesome. <laughs> I know. So I thought we could tell them a little bit about what the project is, how it's funded, and what the purpose is. Well, We are producing a video series, 25 episodes on U.S. history, 25 episodes on world history. And the point of these is to provide teachers who don't know women's history with like a 10 minute video that they could play for their class. So say you're teaching a lesson on the American Revolution. Here's 10 minutes about women in that time period. And it could be a foundation that you can springboard from and do something really cool on those women. And these videos are, yes, you, but they are fully scripted. You can look at the scripts. They're nicely edited with some really great content. Yep. They're vetted by historians, two PhDs, at least in history. So, you know, people smarter than me. (laughs) (laughs) But they're going to be free and they're on YouTube. And they'll be on YouTube. They also have a comedian from Hollywood who is helping to make them funny. So it's, you know, because I'm like kind of boring. Uh, No, very (laughs) funny. (laughs) But that's awesome. So they're really engaging and they're really cool content. So more to come there. So we have those coming out. And those are funded through grants? Through grants, through our patrons. Um, So their, you know, contributions to us through Patreon 
are supporting that project. And then we also have a lot of people that have been donating through Instagram, Facebook. We have a Venmo account. You can find us there. That's awesome. Um, and they're making those contributions. So yeah, it's an amazing thing. And if this is something that you're like, yes, that's what teachers need. Any, every penny helps because it is a really expensive project. So. It, yeah, totally. And we had a match donor for a while there too, yeah. which is really cool. So definitely if you're interested people in those, yeah, feel free to donate. You can donate right on our website, Instagram and Venmo. Yeah. Which is awesome. Great work. I'm oh. excited to see the rest of those videos. Oh, Brooke, thanks for your support of the project. Awesome. Is there anything else you wanted to tell me about the Night Witches? Yes. Um, so I, I, I think that they're this great example of how when women are given even just like the most limited tools, but especially given the opportunity to be in war, how willing they are yeah, to participate. Yeah. Like the 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 night witches themselves, they flew over 23,000 missions. Um, and they dropped more than 3,000 tons worth of bombs. And they became exceptionally strategic, too. Like a lot of these German cities, like I mentioned, they have spotlights. Um, they have anti-aircraft guns. Like they're ready for a lot of raids. And in order to get around that, they would fly in groups of three. And once they got over the city, like most of them would have like these concentric circles of spotlights. So two of the planes would go ahead and make sure that they went right into the path of the spotlights. And then they would start veering away in opposite directions. So the spotlights would follow them and the anti-aircraft guns would fo follow them and fire the whole time, where the third one would just go straight ahead and go after the target, drop their two bombs, they would link back up, and then now they would do it again with another person with bombs would go in and do it. And they would just keep that process up until all three of them had dropped their bombs, go back, and they would get more. And they would just keep doing this stuff. In um, just the 588, the Night Witches themselves, I think 32 or 33 of them were killed in the war, including Raskova herself. Oh, wow. Um, and when we look at um, just Russian participation as a whole, it's this great like study in gender in war um, because 89 women win the Hero of the Soviet Union Award, which is basically the equivalent of the U.S. Medal of Honor. 89 women won it all together. 22 of them were night witches. And it's such an interesting thing because only one woman has ever won the Medal of Honor in America. And it was a whole to do because she won it. It was taken away from her. It was given back to her like posthumously long after. So it's so interesting to look at. Again, we don't like to look at Russia in this war a lot in American history, but it's such an interesting thing to look at the way that they handle gender. There was still a ton of prejudice for the Night Witches. There were plenty of Russian soldiers and Russian officers who did not think that they were their equivalent by any means, but they, they did remarkable work. When they were piloting in these missions, mm -hmm. I, I it dawned on me when you're talking about the process of like tapping them on the shoulder and all that, Yeah, uh, the people in the plane with them are men. Right? Like no, 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 they're women. Yeah, it's a woman okay. pilot and a woman navigator. Okay. Yeah. And then the then their whole grounds crew is all women too. Okay. So they all got the name of being the night witches. Oh, okay, okay. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's even cooler. Okay. Yeah. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah. And eighty nine, how how did that compare to the number of men who were recognized in the war? Mm, I'm not sure of their number. Okay. I'm sure it is exceptionally high yeah. given how many millions of Russians fought. But do you think the fact that only one American woman is just because we really hold that for like exceptional things or are we just sexist so i think the biggest <laughs> <laughs> how do you like <laughs> uh, well it's a it's a dual answer <laughs> um yeah so dr mary walker gets the medal of honor for the u.s during the civil war um and it was it's hard for us to see sort of these as equivalent awards, but it's also a matter that um, predominantly that's meant to be a combat award. So it's something that you are being given because you are going far beyond the pale in combat itself. You are putting yourself at bodily risk. And usually, I mean, very often that award gets given 
posthumously. Like more often than not, I think the Medal of Honor comes to somebody who has passed away. So it's that you are at least willing to put your life on the line for those around you, like in a very, very active sense, or you did so and you paid the ultimate price for it. Women haven't had that opportunity to be in combat. That veil was only lifted in 2015. Mm. So women haven't had the opportunity to do that. Whereas in Russia, while they are in combat throughout the entirety of World War II, that's how they can get yeah, the opportunity they, they have to get the chance that award. To prove it. Right. Of course, in American history, I'm thinking Harriet Tubman, cough, mm-hmm. cough. You know, like, they're, <laughs> right. like women weren't risking their lives. Are you kidding me? Right. <laughs> how exactly. many missions did she take? Oh exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, it happens. But yeah. but you're right. The, the, the chances, the opportunities to do that when women aren't allowed into combat until much more recent history yeah. is problematic. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That is so fascinating. What an interesting um, comparison. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I think in American history, we love to talk about, you know, Soviet denying um, civil liberties to their people right. and the failures of communism and blah, 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 which probably are true. And, oh, you God, know, yeah. we started by talking about the, the famine yes. and the genocide. Yes. So like, yes, that exists. But in, in terms of social equity, part yeah. part of uh, communist rhetoric, at least, is is that that is possible. Right. And, um, and so it's interesting to see the way that that manifested yeah. in the way women are treated during war. Yeah. Now, women served in other branches right. in um, the Soviet Union, mm. as well as other countries. Yeah. yeah. And um, on the ground, one of my absolute favorite figures of the war was Ludmila Pavlichenko, who became known as Lady Death. And I know all these people have the best nicknames. Yes. War nicknames, man. They're killer. And she really ties into what we were just talking about, too, about this idea of equality, because it's one of the things that she ends up calling out while she is serving um, this role. And she's calling it out in the Western world, talking about how, like, in her communist nation, there is true equality for the genders. And like you just said, there is plenty of examples of oppression throughout the communist world, throughout the Soviet Union. And and certainly a lot of the stuff that we even understand, like even a lot of the stuff that she says, it's sort of questionable in nature. Like there's plenty we can kind of dissect there. But she is this incredible figure. She's Ukrainian. And she, from the time that she was very young, she had like this really like baller mission that all she wanted in the world was just to prove that girls were equal to boys in everything that she did, like playing in sports, whatever. Like she is the epitome. Like, you know, that old show tune, like anything you can do. Mm-hmm. I can, like I think of her as being like the epitome yeah. of that song. Everything that and she wanted that to. that song comes from Annie Oakley, who yeah. is a sharpshooter. So right. isn't she a sharpshooter? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All kind of ties together. Well, sharpshooter. Sniper. Sniper. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things that she did to try to prove that girls are equal to boys is she took a marksman class because she wanted to show that she could do it. And she was like 14 years old. She yeah. wanted to show that she could shoot just as well as boys could. And she was remarkable. Um, She will later go on to Kiev University. She was going to school to be a history teacher, which touches my nerdy little heart. (laughs) Like, And um, while she was in school, she kind of continued with marksman training because she enjoyed it and she liked that she was very, very good at it. So she's continuing to take these classes to get better and better and better at it. And then when she's about 23, 24 – the war begins, like the German invasion comes, and she immediately enlists. She was in her last year of school, but she just immediately enlists. And she goes, she tries to join the army, and they're like, you know what you'd be so great at? You should be um, you should be a nurse. Like, we really need extra hands in, in the hospitals. That's where you should go. And she said, absolutely not. She was insistent that she goes into combat, and she wants to be in infantry. That is the only choice. So she does. And as she goes into training, she is recognized as a marksman and she does end up becoming a sniper while she's there. So she passes all the training. She passes all the tests. She is going to be a sniper. There are 2000 women in Russia who become snipers. A quarter of them survive. She is one of them. So she goes and it's it's really interesting because 
You would think I would think that snipers would have a higher survival rate. Is oh, it because they're no. targeted? They're targeted, and as we'll find out with Lumila too, they end up involved in what's called counter sniping, which uh, is sniper duels yeah. between each other. So uh, that comes with a very, very high death rate. Interesting. Yeah. So it's really it's interesting. Man, I <laughs> my my game plan if I ever went to war was to become a sniper. Mm-mm. Nope. Okay. I know. I will. Uh, You're read. looking at kitchen staff over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I belong. Okay. Um, I'll have to rethink my strategy. Yes. Although don't. maybe I want to be in a duel. Maybe I'd be good at that. I yeah. Don't know. Trust your skills, girl. Okay. See I where they bring you. I don't have any skills. I think I've shot a gun Listen like three to the times, rhythm of really. your heart. <laughs> uh, no, so Ludmila, she, um, she's really funny because she has like such the, like this baller history and like everything about her is just like badass. And she goes in and the very first place that she is put is um, under the siege of Odessa. And when she arrives, actually her first day, she freezes. And this happens so often in war that, like, it doesn't matter how well you're trained. Your first time actually seeing combat and seeing, like, its hellish realities, a lot of people freeze up. And it it doesn't matter their motivations for joining the war. Again, like, how extensive their training is. Bravery, courage, fortitude, none of it matters. Yeah, I mean, Psych would tell us fight, flight, freeze. Like, it's one of the options. Exactly. So she was she was full freeze. She was in her position and she like couldn't function. And then there was this younger um, Russian guy who was posting up right next to her, like setting up and trying to like settle into position. Bullet comes, kills him immediately. And she says from that point forward, nothing could stop her. She got her first two kills that very first day. She mm. was just like, from that point, she was like, Germans have to go. Like, not only have they, like, caused as much damage to her people as they have, but she was like, this was like this young boy who was so, like, happy and so full of life. And in that second, he's gone and I can do something about it. Yeah. Um, She was in Odessa for two and a half months. She had 187 confirmed kills in Odessa in two and a half months. She gets picked up. She gets moved to another city. And I can't remember that one off the top of my head. But she gets picked up, moved to another city. Within about six months after that, she's up to 257 kills. And it's at that point that she starts um, participating in that counter sniping. So that comes with a really, really high casualty rate because you think about it that on opposite sides of the field, you have the like two elite sharpshooters. Mm -hmm. And their only goal is to get each other. And because they're both so good at what they do, these can last hours, these can last days. One of hers lasted three days before she finally got the other one. But she won every single duel she participated in. She killed 36 opposing snipers in these duels. Um, So she continued to have like this growing body count. She got wounded three separate times. When she finally gets wounded a fourth time, um, a mortar round exploded near her and she took shrapnel to the face and she had to be removed to go to the hospital. And by that point, Russia had decided that she was too valuable, that she was too much of an asset to actually keep on the field because she had earned this name of being Lady Death. By the time she got pulled from the field, she had 309 confirmed kills. Wow. Yeah. And um, even the Germans knew her by name. Like they would use radios and loudspeakers to call out, Ludmila Pavlichenko, come to our side. You can become a German officer. (laughs) One of them was like, we'll give you chocolate (laughs) if you come over here. It was like... They were literally trying to, like, coax her to the opposing side. So just as a comparison, I was thinking Mm -hmm. about Chris Kyle, American sniper. Mm -hmm. He had 160 confirmed kills and was considered the deadliest sniper in American history. Right. So how many did she have? 309. (laughs) Holy crap. No. No. 309. (laughs) And it, it was so much so there's there's this great moment where the um the Germans when obviously trying to like coax her over <laughs> isn't working. There's this great moment where what they start threatening her and um they call over like the loudspeakers amid a battle and they call her out again by name and they say Ludmila Pavlichenko and they're like, if we catch you, we're gonna tear you into three hundred and nine pieces. And apparently all she did was smile because she was happy they got her number right. 
I'm like, that is badass. <laughs> like, somebody is literally threatening to tear you into pieces and you're just like, at least they got the number right. Like, yeah. Just so good. 309. 309. Wow. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And so from there, like she goes to the hospital and they decide she can't go back to the front lines because they know that having Lady Death on their side is a point of pride for other Soviet soldiers, like having her, like that they can claim. And they're like, if she dies. Yeah, what will that do to morale? That's a morale loss. And it's a big booster for the Germans to be able to take her out. Yeah. So they decide it's far better to use her for propaganda. Yep. So they kind of take her on like this tour of Soviet soldiers to help to boost morale. But they also, this kind of ties to what we were talking about earlier about D-Day as well. Um, They actually sent her on a tour to America, Britain, and um, Canada to convince them to open up that second front in France. So she is actually the first Soviet citizen welcomed as a guest at the White House where she met Eleanor Roosevelt. They became friends for life. At that point. Um, And Roosevelt, having, you know, her own feminist inclinations, she asks Pavlichenko to basically go on like a national tour with her and be like, we do need to encourage the American people that this second front in France needs to be opened. And like everybody knows that that's going to be a bloodbath. And, you know, the entire Italy campaign was sort of like this effort and trying to not have to do that. And it was like becoming more and more obvious that it had to. And, And sort of like we were talking about before, from the Soviet perspective, they pretty much feel like they're being sacrificed by the Western allies. Like you're making us take the entire weight of Germany by ourselves And you won't open the second front because you know it's going to be bloody and you know it's going to be deadly. It already is here. Yeah, hello. (laughs) Right. Like, we're already doing that. Like, and, you know, this will help both of us in the long run. So um, Roosevelt, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, has Pavlichenko go on like a tour with her to help to explain to the American people why that front is going to be necessary. And I think from a feminist perspective, too, Roosevelt really liked the idea of showing people like this is a woman like an elite soldier from Russia, like showing what women are capable of when given the opportunity to go into war. And unfortunately, the American media was not good to Pavlichenko. It's very like male centric media. And they focused on all of the wrong things Mm. like they, you know, they would say that her uniform made her look frumpy and it made her look fat and that, you know, she wasn't wearing a lot of makeup. Yeah, and the things that matter. All those things that matter. Hmm. And Roosevelt, like, did a very good job of, like, encouraging Pavlichenko and just been like, look, I deal with this kind of stupid media all the time. This is what people want to talk about with me and it has nothing to do with what I'm actually doing. And But she didn't even really need that encouragement. Like she was, she always had to speak through a translator. She didn't speak English. So she had a translator with her all the time, but she was like batting back on everything. You know, like um, uh, people asked her like inane questions like, well, aren't you allowed to wear makeup on the front lines? And she's like, there's no rules against it, but who has the time to worry about that? Like there's a war on. Yeah. Like, Um, do you ask the same question of men? Yeah. You know, and, um, that like uh, uh there was a reporter who was again like talking about how her uniform was frumpy and it was like a long skirted uniform and like it made her look you know uh frumpy it made her look fat and all these things and um y- like talking about you know why she doesn't take more pride in her appearance basically and she was like I take a lot of pride in my experience like this uniform has been covered in blood mine and other people's it's been decorated because of all, like, she would, like, list off all the awards that she's won, uh, all the promotions that she's had. Um, she was always just, like, knocking right back with it. And, you know, she would have people that would be like, oh, well, you know, even male soldiers are supposed to take pride in their appearance. And talking back about uh, Joan of Arc, like, we have, you know, people are like, well, when you when you see images of Joan of Arc, isn't she always, like, in pristine armor and on, like, you know, yeah. always clean? And it's like, 
you think a painting is an accurate depiction of what Joan of Arc right. looked like, you know? Um, and yeah, like getting actually shot with right. an arrow, right? Yeah, right. totally. So she would fire back. Covered on, in shrapnel. <laughs> as, exactly, yeah. exactly. She would always fire back on those things. And, you know, when people would ask how a woman is able to handle like the rigors of war, she would say that um, Germans are out there killing men, women, and children, and dead Germans are harmless. So she's like, if I can make Germans harmless, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. So she always had like these excellent answers for things. And um so it, it, <laughs> not very ladylike. <laughs> no, 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 no. She was just like, nope, I'm not playing this yeah. game. Yeah. The best one for me is that like she gets hit with just like this round after round after round of these inane, just idiotic questions. And she finally, like, you know, all of this is building towards the fact that like the Western allies have not opened that second front. And like that is the reason why Soviets are dying in the numbers that they do. And she was totally treated as a novelty. Here is this female officer, because she is a decorated officer by this point. And she's like, you know, here I am treated as like this subject for headlines. Like everybody is all so excited that I am, you know, this this woman in this position. And I'm a woman who has killed this many people. And I am a woman who looks like this. And she's just like, in my country, I'm just like any other soldier. She's like, there's nothing special about the fact that I'm a woman that's fighting. Right. And she called out America's gender segregation and like racial segregation and talked about how equality was so much more evident in Soviet society, which to America, even even though this is before the Cold War, the ideas of communism were already seen as so oppressive by that point. So she's already like towing the line by being like, you're treating me like I am some sort of like freak show element because I'm a woman that's doing this. But in my country, I'm perfectly normal. Right. And and uh, like she finally gets to this point too, talking about the second front and like how people are so much more concerned with her uniform and this, that, and the other thing. And she she finally says at one point, she's like, gentlemen, I've killed 309 fascists and I'm 25 years old. Like, aren't you a little tired of hiding behind my back? And I was just like, yeah, girl. Like, yeah. Yeah. So she is, she she just goes like on this tear through America. Then she's sent to Canada, later to Britain. Finally, she'll end up back at the Soviet Union and they still won't put her back in combat. But towards the end of the war, she is training um, future snipers yeah. from that point. Wow, that's amazing. And it's interesting with both the Night Witches and with mm. her, how th there is this contrast between yeah. the East and the West yeah. that will play out in the Cold War. So I really appreciate how you've set me up through this whole yes. thing because it, that's a component. It's a really mm -hmm. important component. Yeah. Um, and man, she is deadly. Yeah. I, I was looking at, prior to this at different uh, lists of the most deadliest snipers mm -hmm. in world history. Yeah. And she, on a lot of the lists, she doesn't even rank, which is just like unbelievable yeah. because her kill count is higher than the people that they ranked. They ranked yeah. Chris Kyle and other, and other people. And it's unbelievable. Yeah. She is so incredible. Yeah. And I do, I really appreciate that because I think, you know, when you have a women's history podcast, sort of mm -hmm. the emphasis is on like, here's a woman who did it. And we're like very vagina focused, yeah. you know? And it's like, does that actually matter? Like, no. she's just doing it. And I think the reason it matters is because it, it, is because it has mattered in right. our culture. And yeah. that's so messed up. It shouldn't yeah. matter. And yeah. it should be, especially in war, it should be like, do you have two hands? Can you pull a trigger? Like, right. let's go, you know? Right. So, well, and you, you mentioned this when you did like your intro to this section, you mm -hmm. know, this, this theme that you're doing with the podcast that like you have these women that have to come through and like break the glass ceiling. And since since we have had sort of this opening to the American military for women, the firsts have become far less important. We're sort of in that phase that Ludmila was explaining, that we're in a phase that there are enough women in the military now that firsts are less important. What's more important is just like the general contribution that yeah. they're having. There's There's somewhere around like 2 million active duty service members right now, and 16% of enlisted soldiers are women, and 19% of officers are women. And that's still far too few of a minority, 
but it's an incredible growth weight. And it's it's this example of how when women are given the opportunity, they want to fill that role. Yeah. And they can the more that they see that representation being there, yeah. the more that they see that they could be the Pavlichenko, they could be a night witch, you know, like that that representation. We put so much emphasis on it with like movies and TV that representation matters, but it's the same for these real life careers. Yeah. You know, there are a ton of competitive people who want to be the first to do something, but more people want to do something that they see someone else they connect with or they identify with doing. So yeah. the more like women we can highlight in war, the more that people feel like they can fill in those roles. Right. Totally. And I think it's such a, um, you know, like she's a good example. She's in the 40s, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so like women in combat, this isn't new people, yeah, you know, right. this isn't new stuff. It's just, it, just cause it's minority does not mean it's brand new information. Right. Um, not to glorify war by any no. means cause it's horrible, but, oh God, yeah. but, um, you know, and the, the, uh, yeah, that's so, sh such a powerful story. Yeah. And I appreciate, uh, you know, that it's neat to know that there are lots of English sources that teachers can use to get this, mm. these histories in because, yeah both were so known in the West yeah. and um, especially with her tour that she goes on. Yeah. There's got to be lots of newspapers on yep. ProQuest that, that educators could find and use. And, yeah, absolutely. Um, wow. That's yeah. so amazing. Yeah. Oh, Jackie, thank you so much for enlightening me on this piece of the history that I am am so ignorant of. Yes. I will talk about Pavlichenkos and Night Witches every opportunity I'm given. Oh my gosh, you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening to Remedial Her Story, the other 50%. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to your podcasts to bring more voices to the conversation. We really appreciate that effort. Until next time.